listening to the Bold Moves podcast. I am the host, Mandy Bryce, and this is episode number 297. I am super excited to share the story of Jessie Breyer. Her bold move started in high school where she saved a friend's life who was contemplating attempting suicide and continues to moving to Scotland, getting her degree real quick, writing a book, There are tons of amazing stories that she has, as well as a lot of great insight. So I really hope you enjoy my chat with Jesse Byer. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Bold Moves Podcast. Today, I am chatting with Jesse Byer. Welcome to the show, Jesse. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to have you. Now, you know that the show is called Bold Moves, and you wouldn't be here if you hadn't made some yourself. So... Why don't you share a little bit about who you are, what your story is, and why you're here today? Absolutely. So right now I'm a speaker and personal development coach, and I focus on helping people break through expectations and standards and things like that, discover what they really want to do with their lives. And that definitely took me a windy path to get there. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's where a lot of my bold moves came in. Um, I'd say starting in high school. I decided that I wanted to go to vet school straight out of high school instead of going to get an undergraduate degree and then going to vet school. So when I was 17, I moved to Scotland to go to vet school. Wow. And uh, that was that was definitely a little bit of a battle with you know the family and the admissions process and things like that. So I'd say that was kind of bold move number one. And since then, I've kind of navigated my way through some different career options. I left vet school after a year because it was not the right fit for me and pursued a career as an EMT. And then my plan was to go into the military, but unfortunately I couldn't pass the medical background. But that whole process again was kind of a bold move because it was breaking through those expectations of, well, you get a job, you work your way up for 40 years, blah, blah, blah. And um, and then I was like, you want know to scroll that? I'm going to go start my own business. <laughs> and and here I am. So I'd say that most of the bold moves in my life have been career changes and breaking out of that normal pattern of, you know, get good grades, go to college, get good grades there too, get a job, work your way up, retire sort of thing. Sure. I want to bring up something that you put in your application to be on the show that you haven't mentioned that I think is more of a personal life bold move that mm-hmm. kind of caught me in my tracks that happened okay. in high school. I'm sure you know yeah. what I'm talking about. So I'll let you tell the story instead of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So when I was a sophomore in high school, it was the spring of my sophomore year, um, I realized that my friend, one of my really good friends was self-harming. And over that next kind of year and a half, that was really a whirlwind for the both of us because I became his sole confidant. I was the only one that he came to when he was struggling, when he needed support. And I in turn felt very responsible for him and his happiness and his life, honestly. And um, unfortunately that relationship ended with him attempting suicide and me calling the cops on him to prevent that. So he is still alive right now, which is, I guess, the win of that story. But it was definitely a struggle to make that decision because I was struggling with my mental health as well. So I was in the same boat. So it was almost like I was riding on myself when I called the cops on him because I knew what that would feel like if he did that to me. I knew how much of his trust I was breaking. But, um, you know, obviously in the end it paid off because he is still alive today. But that was definitely a bold move in, in the personal part of my life for sure. Absolutely. And if I'm not mistaken, that has sort of molded part of your career and your advocacy work. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, definitely. So I really resented that part of my life for a long time. I didn't want anything to do with it. I didn't want to incorporate it into my future. I didn't want to have it as part of my career. But I realized that I kept being drawn back to this concept of saving people when they were in most need of it. Mm -hmm. So when I decided that I wanted to go be a paramedic and get my, my license and things like that, that was really the driving force there. But I didn't, I didn't recognize it. I wasn't able to sit there and say, oh, it's because of this event from high school that I'm kind of turning this way. But as I got older and as I got further into college, I realized I didn't want to fight it anymore. You know, I didn't want to keep battling that part of myself because it is a part of myself, whether I like Mm -hmm. it or not. Um, and so I really embraced that and I recognized that I could use that experience to fuel some of my career choices. So I help people with personal development, but then I'm also currently training to be a sexual assault advocate and a canine search and rescue handler. And I'm debating going back to school to get my, uh, my master's in crisis counseling. So my undergrad, I got from the U of M in Psycho- University of Minnesota. Sorry. There's so many M's um, there. from, 
the University of Minnesota and my capstone project was about trauma. And then, as I said, I've kind of made some choices since then to really focus on trauma from a mental health perspective, from a physical medical standpoint, and then from a personal development standpoint as well. That's really interesting. And I love how you've combined so many different things to one career, you know, the different aspects of the medical side and then the more psychological side. I think it's really interesting that you come with such a multifaceted background to personal development and, like mm -hmm. you said, the crisis coaching, because I think they all can go hand in hand, especially for people who have mental health issues and are wanting to improve in any way with personal development. Can you tell me more about like what you do now with all of those things? Yeah, so a lot of it is still in the works. It takes about two years to train a search and rescue dog, and I just started with the sexual assault advocacy course. So that takes like three months, and then I find a volunteer team to work with so a lot of that is really just in the works right now mm -hmm. but as far as the coaching in, in personal development and mental health like I said it's a lot of helping people break out of the limiting beliefs that they have to do one thing they have to be in one area on one path and helping them realize that they can move through that they can be proud of parts of themselves that maybe aren't things you put on the trophy case normally and really helping them um, be passionate and be fulfilled and move through all those things in their life. So I'm not a, a licensed counselor. I don't have the qualifications to be a licensed counselor right now. So I can't give medical advice or therapeutic right. advice, but I can sit there and say, Hey, I've been there. I've been where you are and I know how it feels. So let me tell you what I did to get out of that. So maybe you can use the same strategies for yourself. I love that because yes, of course there's limitations with licensure and laws mm -hmm. and there should be, but to help someone, you really only need to be one step ahead of right. where they are. So it's great that you can use that past experience, both of your own experience, as well as your friend or former friend to, you know, keep having a positive impact on people who really need it. I think yeah. that's fabulous. Absolutely. And it's like going to a therapist can be really intimidating. It's very yeah. formal. There's paperwork and insurance and billing and all these other aspects, but it takes none of that just to sit down with someone and say, Hey, I'm here and hold their hand through whatever they're going through. So it's different. Absolutely. But I think it's almost just as necessary and beneficial as official therapy. Yeah, I could see that for sure. I'm curious if you have any tips for anyone who may be in the same situation as you, who has a friend that they know is self-harming or in a dark place, or people who are in a dark place themselves, what kind of guidance or tips, of course, nothing that anyone could come back and be like, well, Jesse Byer said on this podcast that I did this yeah. and now, whatever. Like with that legal disclaimer of this is, you know, just kind yeah. of advice and not you know, law or anything, what, what kind of advice or help would you offer in that way? Definitely. So for someone who's in the position of trying to support someone, the best thing you can do is just sit there with them. And I had a really good analogy from someone that I interviewed for the book that I wrote about trauma. Um, and she said that sometimes you just have to sit in the dumpster with them. It's smelly. It's dark. You don't want to be there. They don't want to be there. And you might want to get out as soon as you can, but they can't get out. And so just sitting there and being with them and letting them know that they're loved, that they're not alone, um, that their feelings are valid, that what they're going through is totally okay that's honestly the most important thing you can do you don't have to fix them you don't have to tell them that it's all gonna be okay and just hang in there because that is you know disrespectful to the feelings that they're having right now but just literally just being there and it's called holding this space for them in the in the psychological world for someone who's in that position one of the biggest regrets that I had from when I was struggling with my mental health is that I didn't pursue therapy. I went to one day and got freaked the heck out because I didn't want to go to talk therapy. I was worried. I was only 17. So I was worried that they were going to tell my mom about everything. And my mom didn't know about what was going on. And so lots of worries there, but there are so many different types of therapies. You can do nature therapy. You can be working with horses. You can be working with dogs. You can be working with flower essences and dancing and all these different types of therapies. You don't have to go sit and talk to a therapist like couch, couch to couch in front of them sort of thing, if that's not comfortable for you. So explore your options and pursue something that's the most comfortable for you because getting that help is really, really critical. And like we said, you know, as great as your friends are, therapy is great too. So, you know, get both of those support levels in your life. I love that. How would you recommend somebody find the right therapist or the right modality? Like you said, there's so many different things that people can be doing for them. 
Mm -hmm. I would really look at what you're interested in. So if you find that you're often at peace when you're outside, then look at different nature-based therapists, ecotherapy, things like that. If snuggling your dog really, really helps you, then look for canine-assisted therapy or a therapist that works with a registered canine, things like that. Sometimes it's just going to be trial and error. You're going to walk into a place and be like, oh my God, this is not for me and walk right back out. Or you're going to be like, oh, this feels like home. And you're going to know to pursue that. And it's totally okay if you go through five, six, seven therapists that aren't the right fit for you before you find that one, because that one is going to be so worth it. So unfortunately, some of it is just trial and error, but make an educated guess based on your interest and where you feel most at peace in the world. I'm so glad that you said that because I have had a couple different therapists and with a variety of how well they fit. One that was amazing, one where I was like, okay, I actually feel worse after coming here than I did yep. before. And it's just a matter, it's like almost like dating where you might have to kiss a couple frogs before you find your prince. Yep. You gotta kind of try people out and don't judge therapy on its own by one person or one experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. And one other thing to add to that too, is that some therapists will give you a diagnosis, whereas others don't give you a diagnosis. And sometimes that can make a big difference. The first therapist that I went to, we chatted for about 30 or 45 minutes. And then she slapped me with a diagnosis and was like, right on you go on your way. I'm like, what? (laughs) You don't know anything about me. You just spent half an hour with me. But the therapist that I had most recently, she was not a diagnostic therapist. She had her PhD, but she wasn't a diagnostic therapist, and it was great. You know, there wasn't this label or stigma of, oh, you have this, or oh, you you have all the, these symptoms that this book says you should have to uh, right. comply with this diagnosis. It was much more relaxed, and so for me, that felt better. But for some people, they might need that diagnosis to be like, like hey, I'm not alone. Other people are going through the same thing. So mm-hmm. that's something to consider as well, how you may feel about that. And if you didn't feel good when you got a diagnosis before, then maybe pursue a therapist that doesn't diagnose in that same way. Yeah, I think that's a great tip. I feel like almost sometimes for some people, a diagnosis might actually turn into more of a self-fulfilling prophecy that you think, okay, well, this is why I'm this way. So then maybe that intensifies or you start exhibiting other Mm -hmm. behaviors that are tied to that diagnosis and it could be damaging. So I'm glad that you say that because I didn't even know that there were those options. So thank you. for Yeah. Yeah. Well, neither did I until I found her. So there we go. (laughs) Well, you made a step for the rest of us, I guess that you're (laughs) the one can avoid it. Um, I'm curious too more about your story and background. So I know you got your bachelor's degree from Minnesota and I want to talk about that a little bit too. I don't know where you're from and where you live now. I love to hear like the travel story because I guess you moved to Scotland and I don't know where you went and got the EMT training. So you want to give the like geographical (laughs) history. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I was born in Washington, just south of Seattle. And I moved to just outside of Portland, Oregon when I was three. I spent my childhood there. And then my first year in college, I spent in Scotland. I then the summer after that got my EMT license in British Columbia. And then immediately went to Minnesota for two years to finish my bachelor's. And then now I'm back just outside of Portland, but in a different city, uh, different suburbs sort of thing. So yeah, I've done like the full circle spectrum thing there of educational locations. (laughs) Yeah, that's quite the variety. I love it. I don't know why you keep choosing cold places, but (laughs) (laughs) I'm actually from Wisconsin and one of my best friends is a golden gopher and she just yesterday posted a picture of the axe that you finally got back from us badgers having them (laughs) having it for like 12 years or something. (laughs) Oh my gosh, that's funny. Yeah, there's a little bit of rivalry, but it's all, it's very friendly. (laughs) I'll still air your podcast, even though you're... Oh, good. Thank you. I really appreciate it. (laughs) Badgers can be nice and take the high road. (laughs) Yeah, the Minnesota cold doesn't quite freeze our souls enough that we're all evil, so... (laughs) That's fair. Yeah, I'm in LA now, and every time I go to a college around here, like when I've been to Stanford's campus, USC, UCLA, I'm like what was I doing? I didn't know (laughs) like these campuses with palm trees everywhere existed. So (laughs) I can't imagine throwing Scotland and British Columbia into the mix too. So I guess they're not as bad as Minnesota at all. 
Um, Scotland and British Columbia are pretty similar to Oregon. They're much more moderate, but yeah, I, I definitely favor the colder areas. <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever works for you. I guess maybe for me, it would be fewer distractions because I wouldn't be always wanting to like go by the ocean or something. Or Pepperdine in Malibu, like their windows just face the ocean and palm trees. It's crazy. yeah. <laughs> so I'm curious throughout all of this story of yours, you've done so many scary things. Like you said, when you were calling the police that time, you knew you were betraying your friend's trust, mm -hmm. moving to a new country a couple times. Is, mm -hmm. I'm sure scary. What is the scariest moment you've survived so far? Absolutely. That night when I had to call the cops, like sure. I use that as motivation for other moments where it's like, you've made it through that night. You've been through so much worse. You can make it through this hard workout or this exam or whatever it is that I'm currently, you know, stressed or working through. But yeah, absolutely that night. I love that you said that you've used that to move forward because I always ask people it like once they tell me what the scariest thing they've done or lived through, I always ask like, well, how do you push past that fear and what do you recommend? And sometimes people say like, I kind of make an evidence list of all the other scary things that I've survived and say, well, mm -hmm. if you've done that, you can do this. Mm -hmm. so obviously use that method. Do you have any other tips for pushing past fear of someone who's listening is considering doing something scary? I would honestly suggest removing the perspective of pushing through it like let it sit let it settle you know let it eat at you if you need to but then progress through it in a more natural way because if you're just trying to like shove through it and shove through it and push and push and push and not allow yourself to really come to terms with those feelings they're going to start sneaking back up on you the next time you do a scary thing or the next time you drive by that place where the first scary thing was you're going to kind of keep it's still going to be there. So allowing yeah. yourself to work through those feelings at the rate that you need to work through them is really the best tip that I can give. I think that's so great because as a serial repressor for most of my life, <laughs> I've had plenty of times where I push things down and then at the worst possible moment, I'm like crying while I'm out to dinner or something because yeah. some stupid thing that was tiny triggered it and it doesn't make sense. And I look like a crazy person because <laughs> why are you crying because you're looking forward to this meal and they didn't have it <laughs> yeah, I know. That thorn shrimp scampi I really yeah. wanted it and it's like well actually it's all these other things that I've been not addressing that are popping up now by that little trigger so I think that's great and that one thing I love about this podcast is getting so many perspectives because sometimes when I ask that question people say like yeah that's exactly what you need to do you need to push right through and then other people are like no <laughs> so I think it's so great to hear from so many people and what works for one person is going to be different for another mm -hmm. so thank you for sharing that now yeah we talked about your variety of backgrounds and approaches, whether it's vet school or EMT or your bachelor's degree and the training that you're doing now. I'm wondering if through all of this exploration, if you feel that you've found your purpose, and if so, if you wouldn't mind sharing what that is or your perspective on that question. Yeah, definitely. So I'm going to go with perspective first, and then I'll share my purpose. But I've had a lot, a lot of people either speak for me or ask me when I've been making these changes, oh, you know, what are you going to do? Oh, Jesse doesn't really know yet. She's still figuring it out. And I always reject that because I know every career change that I've made has just been straightening out on my path of where I want to be. So I knew traditional college was not a great fit for me. So I was like, vet school. Um, it's going to enable me to save lives in an immediate fashion. And I love animals. So that sounds great okay, that's not the right fit. How about we go to something where there's a little less bureaucracy and it's just you in the back of an ambulance. Cool. Okay. Wow. Now let's take out this, um, you know, the calls for old people who need to go to the hospital and things like that and really focus it on trauma in the military career. Wow. That's perfect. And that's honestly what I think would have been the perfect career for me was that military career. But unfortunately I couldn't pass the medical background. So then it was like, okay, now we just shift a little bit more. Yeah. So I think that every step that I've made has been still on the same path, just aligning more and more with what I learn about those career fields. That all being said, as I just dropped it on, um, that all being said, I think that I would classify my purpose as saving someone's life in their immediate need. So being a doctor, being an oncologist or something, that would be great. And you definitely save lives, but you're working with them for a long period of time. It's lots of appointments. It's, you know, a more drawn out process. Whereas 
if you're doing search and rescue or sexual assault advocacy or something like that, it is immediate. It is one hour, 15 minutes. That's what you have with them to make that difference. And that's what really calls to me. Mm, I love that. And that I love how specific you got, because that's another question where people can either be very general with, I want to make people happy, or mm -hmm. like you said, very specific where it is in their hour of immediate need. Mm -hmm. I want to be there with my cape, superwoman. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to be like, I'm the superhero, but that's kind of what I want to be. You know, I want right. to be there when they need it most. And when they're in imminent danger of falling apart, that's when I really want to be there for them. That's amazing. And I absolutely love that. Now I have a question for you because it seems like there's sort of two ways that you're doing this one with the trauma counseling and for sexual assault survivors and then, or victims, I guess, to be survivors. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the other one with the animals and the rescue dogs. I have like mm -hmm. a limited knowledge on the rescue dog thing. I I'm a makeup artist. I'm not sure how much you looked into me before this. And <laughs> one of the times that I worked for People Magazine, I actually was doing makeup on this woman who started a foundation where she actually trains rescue dogs to rescue people in crisis situations. So That's awesome. Yeah. So like she'll take dogs from animal shelters and train them and then they can go when there's an earthquake or a bomb or whatever it is and get people out. Is that the same kind of rescue dog situation you're working with where it's like saving people who are maybe trapped under rocks or is it something different that I don't even know about? Yeah, so it's, it's similar to that. It's kind of the step before that. So a brief overview of search and rescue dogs. When you start training them, you usually pick one of two tracks. You can have them be an air scent dog, which means that they smell scent that's coming on the air yeah. or a tracking and trailing dog where they follow a scent trail on the ground so they walk exactly where the person walked that they're trying to find okay. once you get that certification whichever route you go which takes two two and a half years you can then specialize in avalanche um in urban which is finding people under rubble in hrd which is human remains detection which is finding dead people or parts of dead people mm -hmm. um if you have a Newfoundland, you can do water rescue. I'm trying to think of the other parts right now. But yeah, those are the main areas. And so what I'm training to do right now is that air scent piece. So we're in the beginning of our two years. And after that, I do want to get my dog certified for avalanche and for urban search as well. So we would be able to help with natural disasters and avalanches or just general people who are lost in the woods. Okay, that's really interesting. I got to spend the whole day at the place that she has all the dogs in training and watch some of them, like puppies that were basically like someone would hide in a barrel and there'd be other barrels and they got treats if they found the right barrel that the person was in. And it was just really cool to see. Is that, are you planning to integrate the two things you're doing or is that kind of just like two passions that you're pursuing simultaneously? Yeah, so I, I look at my life and I see that there's really two main pieces. The one piece is the business aspect and the personal development coaching and speaking and things like that. And then the other aspect is what I call my rescue puzzle. And that looks like search and rescue with my dog, sexual assault advocacy. If I go back to school for crisis counseling, that would get thrown in there too. So that's kind of the immediate life saving sort of puzzle over there. And then yeah. the business more drawn out puzzle is over here. So I'd say that those are kind of the two definitions of my two passion areas. I guess. Okay. But yeah, they're all kind of things that I'm doing together. And because I have my EMT license, I can in integrate that with searches. You know, if we find someone who's hurt at the top of the mountain, I can help them there. Or if we find someone who was sexually assaulted, I can integrate that there. But it's, it's all kind of different pieces that meld together to create a life that I'm just so excited for. I love that. I love the variety and I love how it still all ties together for basically the same mission. So that's super cool and I'm excited to see where you're heading. Now, if people want to follow you or hire you for the personal development part or as a speaker or similar, where can we find you on social media, website, and so on? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm on Facebook and Instagram at Jesse Byer International and the links I'm assuming are going to be below this. Um, and then I'm also hosting a free webinar discussing how your language and your words and your thoughts uh, equates to success or lack of success. Mm -hmm. So that link I believe is going to be below as well. So you can come check me out there. That's totally free. Um, and then my website is jessiebyerinternational.com. So pretty straightforward there. <laughs> Okay, awesome. Yes, that's all going to definitely be in the show notes. So people will be able to access that easily. 
Now, with all of these different trainings you're doing and potentially advanced degrees and so on, uh, it, I can tell that you're passionate about learning. So I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you're a reader, and if so, if you have any books to recommend. And that can be within your niches. It can be something that's relaxing to do when you're not studying or taking on something new. Whatever kind of books you'd like to recommend, I'd love to share that with the listeners or viewers. Yeah, absolutely. So I thought about this question a lot. Because uh, I was like, oh my god, what do I say? What do I say? Because my favorite books to read are romance books, pretty much unequivocally. You can share them. People have shared those before. So feel free yeah. to throw a couple of those for anyone who's looking for that. Yeah, I definitely will. But I just want to say that if you're looking for success or knowledge or learning through your books, I really encourage you to read whatever inspires you. If that's history yeah. novels, if that's romance, if that's business books, whatever that is, because I've gotten career advice from romance books. I've gotten therapy from romance books. I've gotten business ideas from romance books. Like I've gotten so many different pieces of knowledge and inspiration from romance books. That's um, hilarious so, and awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's just like my side note of read whatever the heck inspires you and then get what you need out of that instead of focusing on a specific niche. That being said, um, Molly McAdams, Megan March, and Jennifer Armentrout are my three favorite authors for sure. I would recommend starting with From Ashes by Molly McAdams. That, do you want synopses of the books or just the titles? Um, whatever you feel like sharing. I guess okay. a brief synopsis would be good because then if people are like, oh yeah, that sounds great, they can go, go after that. Yeah, so uh, From Ashes is about a girl who escapes a very abusive family and moves to Texas with her best friend who's in love with her, but she... She's not in love with him, and then she ends up finding her person in Texas, and it's a really cute story. And then the Jennifer Armentrout Lux series, it's L-U-X, is a series about a girl who falls in love with an alien, and it's way better than it sounds. Like, that sounds so <laughs> cliche. But um, there's, like, some government conspiracy aspects. There's a lot of loyalty and dedication and things like that. And then Megan March has a series based in New Orleans, and it's different titles, but they're all, like... Um, it's beyond these, whatever. So beyond these chains, beyond these scars, things like that. Okay. And that is obviously set in New Orleans, but it's just a bunch of people and their stories and their broken pasts and how they interact and how all of the stories are related and the friend groups that are formed and things like that. I feel like those are really bad synopses because I did not sell those well, but they're all really, really good. <laughs> um, those are my three favorite authors. Anything by them, I will endorse 100%. <laughs> Okay, awesome. I think that those were not as bad, so don't sell yourself short, because I'm not a <laughs> romance novel person, or at least I don't think so. I don't even know if I've ever read one, but those all sounded intriguing, even after, like, maybe the first line of the second book that a woman falls in love with an alien, like, if I had the ability to raise one eyebrow, I would have, but I can't, like, work my face that way. But then when you explained a little more, it did sound pretty intriguing, so don't sell yourself short on <laughs> the book synopsis. <laughs> so I'm curious, I, you, I feel like you've given so much value already with just the things that have come up in natural organic conversation, but mm -hmm. just in case you have a message that you want to share or lessons that you've learned recently that you think would be helpful to our listeners or viewers, I want to give you the opportunity to say anything else that's on your heart that you haven't said so far. So if you've got any sage advice or helpful hints or anything to pass along, I would love to hear them. Yeah, definitely. So I have a quote and a lesson that I want to share. The quote is absolutely my favorite quote. It is my life motivation. It's what I use when I'm feeling down or feeling like I'm not motivated. And it goes, um, we are here to laugh at the odds and live our lives so well that death will tremble to take us. And it's by Charles Bukowski. And I, I just feel like the fire rising up inside of me every time I hear that quote and part about you know, battling death and all those other things that just really calls to me. And then the lesson that I want to share is I would really encourage everyone listening to write your own dictionary. And what I mean by that is that you're often told to build a life that's successful and fulfilling and happy, but no one ever tells you to think about what those words mean for yourself because success and fulfillment and happiness and ambition and adventure and all these other adjectives that you want to put on your life are going to look different for everyone. So take some time try to remove those expectations and standards and everything you think you know about what it means to have a successful life and figure out what that means for yourself. Pursue that instead of what everyone else tells you to do. And that's how you're going to have the best, most fulfilling and authentic life that you can possibly have. So that's my words of wisdom. <laughs> I love that. Now I want to go back to the quote, even though both were just amazing, but mm -hmm. isn't Charles Bukowski, wasn't he like a, 
drunk and kind of a a lot of people considered him a mess or a failure. I don't know a ton about him, but I feel like I, he has a reputation of not being like a upstanding citizen, I guess. Yeah, he really it. doesn't have the best reputation. I fell in love with his quotes before I learned about his reputation. Uh -huh. And yeah, I think the drunken part and like the not that great of a member of society part are definitely true, but I didn't know him. I don't know what's true. I don't know what's not true, but I know how sure. his words speak to me. So I still hold on to them. That's amazing. And I think sometimes hearing from people that don't have an absolutely perfect history, reputation, or life is almost more inspiring because it's like you can identify a little bit with some of that more sometimes. Like, okay, yeah. that's not a perfect person who, you know, was born rich and had everything handed to him or had no problems whatsoever. So I think yeah. that's really cool. And I loved the other lesson as well. And I think that's absolutely true because I think that's kind of a, a tenant behind this podcast is that, you know, the bold moves are doing exactly what you said, where you're not like picking a job and staying with it for 40 years and moving up the ladder or, you know, choosing your own love life or whatever it is. So I think mm -hmm. that that's really cool. And I really appreciate that you added that. Thank you. Yeah. So I have one last question for you. And I recently got actually a prop for this. I've been asking everyone this for years, even before I have the podcast, but okay. little Jesse, like eight year old, Jesse had a crystal ball, which is what oh, I a new prop. If you had a crystal ball and you could see where you are today and, you know, of course the trip to Scotland, British Columbia, all over the place, Minnesota, all those glamorous locations, <laughs> as well as where you are now. And then, you know, that you're considering these training programs and kind of where you're heading in the foreseeable future on a scale of one to 11, how excited would eight-year-old Jesse be to see where you are today and where you're headed? A 13 and a half for sure. I mean, I look back at where I was when I was in high school in that relationship and I was comparatively to now I was broken. I was a shell of who I could have been. It was, you know, all of these things. And yet I was still able to accomplish so much in high school, not to sound like I'm bragging or anything, but I graduated high school with 40 college credits. I was a three time state champion in different athletics and things like that. And so being able to push through that and still succeed and then continue to become more authentic and more passionate and moving towards where I am now, that transition I'm so incredibly proud of. And the transitions that I'm making and the future that I'm building right now is something that I'm so excited for. So I'd say at least a 13 and a half. I first of all, A, love that it's such a high number. B, I love that it's a strange number, 13 and a half, because obviously <laughs> since I gave you a 1 to 11 scale, I think we're on the same page there with liking a little flair in our yep. number ranges. And then I'm also so glad that even though you gave the disclaimer that you didn't want to brag, that you did say those things because first of all those are really cool and i want to hear more about how you did that and what sport and so on but then i also want to bring up something that as many high achieving bold move making people do you glossed over just like oh and then i wrote a book and then da 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 <laughs> no it was like and then i picked up my clothes from the dry cleaners and it wasn't a big deal so i forgot because i got so interested in whatever else you said right after all right oh my gosh do you hear that no i don't okay so we're gonna have to edit this my phone has been doing something really weird where um okay when my phone rings it plays any video that's paused on my uh <laughs> safari and so i don't know who called me I like clicked no <laughs> right away, but it started playing a YouTube video of a commercial I did makeup for. That was oh, funny. some astronaut thing, and I'm like, oh, what's going on? <laughs> so, Sienna, I'm sorry, you're going to have to edit this one too. That's me talking to my assistant. So, <laughs> I'm going to go back to um, asking you about your book. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So, you just glossed over the fact that you've written a book as though it is something as simple as like 
going through the drive through to pick up fast food or something. So I would love to hear again, like I said, what sport you played and how you managed to graduate high school with 40 college credits, which is insane. And then I would, of course, like you to plug your book and tell us more about that because that should have been in your book recommendations, young lady. But I got too yeah, okay. interested in what you were saying after that, like I was totally lost my mind and forgot about the book. So let's hear more about those accomplishments and pat yourself on the back because those are all amazing. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So when I was in high school, I played soccer, basketball, and track. And so I was in, I won my team and I won two state championships for soccer and then one for basketball, as well as one second place for basketball and one second place for soccer. So yeah, that was, that was a sports thing. Um, college credits. Yeah. So I took a lot of AP courses. My junior and senior year were pretty much all AP courses. Okay. And I got some credits from a local community college because one of my teachers was also a teacher there. So we could joint credit that or something. I don't know exactly how that worked, but I got a lot of credits awesome. there. So that's how that worked. And then my book. Yeah. So my senior year of college, I wrote a book called how to heal natural and integrative therapies for healing from trauma. And like I discussed before about all those different types of therapies that are out there. That's really what that book walks you through is it starts with my story of that relationship with that individual on that night that I called the police on him, talks a little bit about trauma and then gives a really simple practical guide for different, I think I have nine different therapy methods in there and shows some research on them, some expert interviews and things like that. So that's, what that's all about. Unfortunately, I haven't found a publisher yet as that can take many, many years to find. Yeah. Um, so I have a completed manuscript, but no publisher right now. So okay. I just, I'm really excited about that because I think it's something that not a lot of people talk about. You know, you hear talk therapy or no therapy when there's actually so many other options that are sometimes more effective than talk therapy, especially for trauma healing. So I'm really excited to be able to get that out into the world and share that with people and help them move through their trauma history in maybe a less traditional way, but a just as effective way. Okay, that's amazing. And I guess it makes sense now because when you said that you had two years left of school, it didn't add up to me. And then now I'm like, oh, well, she had 40 credits <laughs> before she left high school. So that probably gave you a jump start on uh, finishing your degree fast, yeah. even with the side derailing of vet school and the uh, yeah. EMT training. So now it all comes together yeah. and makes sense. Well, Jesse, it's been an absolute pleasure to chat with you. I feel like I could probably talk to you all day, but I don't know if people would really want to listen to me talking to someone all day. <laughs> so thank you so much for what you're doing in the world because it's so important, everything that you're doing. I really appreciate it. And then also thank you for taking the time to speak with me and share your story today. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I had a really great time. I, of course, hope that you enjoyed that, found it enlightening, entertaining, inspiring. And if you did, please share this with someone else who could use the messages and the inspiration and motivation from it. I would also love it if you went and checked out the show notes. That's where you can find the link to what Jesse is talking about with that webinar she's doing, as well as links to her social media, her romance novel recommendations, and all of those good things can be found at boldmovespodcast.com. So please head there. While you're sharing this episode with your friends, family, and followers, I'd love it if you hit subscribe if you haven't already so that you don't miss an episode, including an awesome challenge coming from Jesse this Friday. And I would love it if you also left a positive review on Apple Podcasts or any site that has reviews available for my show because that could help the algorithm encourage other people to listen to these messages and stories and hopefully be inspired as well. All right, that's all for me for now. Thank you so much for listening. And as always, be bold and have a sparkly day. Bye-bye.